You're listening to Conservation Connection. Presented by Last Chance Endeavors. I'm Chance. I'm Sarah Catherine. And we are a husband and wife team that runs an environmental education nonprofit focused on connecting students to the environment. Here on Conservation Connection, we do just that by introducing you to the groundbreaking science and conservation work that's happening every day across the globe. We talk to professionals in the world of conservation science and the environmental movement, and we ask them about their career, their current projects, their wild and crazy stories from the field, and everything in between. This episode is brought to you by the Wild and Scenic Film Festival in Nevada City, California. Wild and Scenic presents environmental and adventure films to illustrate the Earth's beauty, the challenges that our planet faces, and the work communities worldwide do to protect our home. Join us as we discover just how these dedicated people are working to protect our planet. Let's get to the show. Alrighty, guys, welcome to another episode of Conservation Connection. We're here at the Wild and Scenic Film Festival in Nevada City, California, having a great time. Uh, And this is an episode I've been looking forward to all weekend. We were sitting down with, he's consistently said, just Daniel. But this is Daniel Curry. (laughs) He is a subject of the film Range Rider. He's a self-described bridge builder. He's a conservationist, and uh, he's got a really cool story to tell. Yeah, welcome to the show, Daniel. Well, thank you, guys. I appreciate the opportunity. We're super glad to have you here, and I kind of just want to start with getting an overview of the story of Range Rider, Um, so anyone who's interested in watching it later on can know what they're getting into. So yeah, Range Rider, I believe, is a a 29 and 20, it's about a half an hour um, length, and it shines light on my work in Northeast Washington. Um, I own my own small business in human wildlife conflict mitigation, so what that means to me is kind of accounting for our ecological impact as human beings on this planet and trying to um, balance the interests of animals and wildlife and our planet and the interests of humans because I believe that we're lacking that. I think Range Rider is a good, um, it captures that really well. It shows um, kind of the ends of the spectrum potentially and then what success can look like. So it's a really beautiful story about uh, building a bridge and listening to another viewpoint that maybe you didn't share in the beginning and learning how to extend our perception to maybe account for some of these differences in each other because we are much more connected on many levels than what most of us realize, um, even on the ends of the spectrum. So, yeah, I love that. And I, th- I think that that idea of connection across disparate groups of people is critical, especially nowadays when there's so much division and, and it, you know, you can have a conversation if you don't find common ground with, with somebody else. We all, we're all on the same planet. We all rely on the same things. So let's work together and not against each other and and really put our efforts into solving the problem and not fighting each other, right? And I I think that also goes right into this idea of human wildlife conflict mitigation because the story in of Western culture on the American continent is like we move into a space, we eliminate all the apex predators that would compete with our livestock, um, and then we just deal with the ecological consequences of that the best that we can. And that's that is what range rider and your work in Northeast Washington is, you know, trying to show that it doesn't have to be that way. Right. So what are the kinds of conflicts that you're helping to mitigate where you're at? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so the prim- primarily the conflict is, I mean, on the ground, it's wolves and livestock or wolves and just rural America. So it's not necessarily dealing with just people that have large ranching, um, facilities or like large ranching operations. I also expand it. I'm trying to, I've done a, it all depends on funding, right? But um, I've I've got this concept in my head that uh, there is this rural and urban divide and there are such valuable perspectives and insight on both that really we need to come together, like you said, Chance, to to find that true solution. I believe that, especially nowadays, like you said, we we need this. It's critical um, in our evolutionary path as human beings just like morally and just as uh our planet is in this ever-changing state that we need to really find sustainable actual solutions and i believe that to do that you really have to not air your mentality or your perspective into an echo chamber and i think that's really prevalent a lot of the times and that's something that i just didn't feel like that was the best way to accomplish my goals i was like you know what i'm going to move up into this area or it's just the ranching community and they completely in the beginning generally just did not like wolves in the landscape. Um, generationally, they haven't had to deal with that since the 1930s. They were extirpated 
from 95% of their home range. So, when these animals came back after the reintroduction in 95 in the GYA, the greater Yellowstone area, um, they kind of spread naturally. And if you imagine like that apex predator has been removed, right? So, now we have this like huge uh, available viable habitat. There's this amazing prey base. It's almost, it's just too high of a prey base because there was no apex predator. And they're naive, right? They don't have yeah. generational strategies for exactly. predation avoidance, like, right? What is that, a wolf? Like, you know, yeah. like, oh, <laughs> I gotta run. So, um, I believe that that uh, really put that community in a place that they were like, wow, we're just, we're, we're scared. We're fearful of losing our culture. We're, we're fearful of losing our livelihoods. And that's something that I didn't want to see go away. That's really important to me, especially after meeting these families that, you know, not, not everybody's like that, right? I mean, it's like a bell curve. You have extremes on either side. The environmentalist extremes are, are saying, kick them off public land, just get them out of here, destroy the ranching community. And then the ranchers like, just kill every wolf there is. And right. I remember going to this talk um, at Colville when I first went there, or first moved there. And I mean, the capacity for the building was like 100 people. There was probably 350 people there. <laughs> There's like cops lining the, the auditorium. And I was like, wow, this is an intense subject here. And I remember <laughs> going up there and speaking just my heart of hearts. And I was like, you know, I feel like I just see two different factions throwing rocks at each other. And the only thing that's actually getting hurt is what you both love. So why are we doing this? There's got to be a better way. And and there was one gentleman and there was really powerful. Everybody's like, oh, come on, shut up. You know, and there's like one guy, he just, he yells, he's like, let him talk. And I was like, wow, thank you. You know, and all you need is that first root. You know, you just need that first little catalyst. Right. And so, I mean, to, that's a long winded question, but, or answer your question, but like the conflict on the ground, wolves and livestock, you know, rural America and wolves and large carnivores, um, like bears and cougars also. And we have a little bit of a, a grizzly population up there. So my methodology can actually effectively help kind of bridge that gap between everybody and keep everybody safe. But beyond that, I think um, it's kind of like that rural urban divide is a huge factor of that. And that's also something I'm trying to bridge. So is that kind of answer? Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. And it's it's this kind of really interesting microcosm, again, of yeah. like wolves and cattle and this sort of like rural America versus hyper extreme environmentalist. Like it's it's these two warring factions that we have to find ways to not be separate factions and instead come together. And I get, I mean, I feel like we're going to hammer that point home all podcast long. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Because that's the whole, that's the solution is coming together and, and working together, working alongside somebody who doesn't share your views, working alongside somebody who votes differently than you do or thinks differently than you do and finding ways that not only in spite of that, but because of that, you come to a better solution than either of you would have individually. You, you just kind of hit the nail on the head, in my opinion, Chance. It's like, when we have a one-sided solution, it's not truly a solution, is it? It's a one-sided, you right. know, a, a attack almost is what it's usually viewed at, you know. So, I think by having these different ends of the spectrum come together, you find that actual solution and move forward with that because truly it, it does come down to just um, – like, for example, I, I'll just go into this a little bit. Like, Washington, I think, is perfectly set up in a way and, and – for either negative or positive. I, I don't know. I've always looked at like, uh, you know, when you go into a job interview and they're like, hey, what's your three strongest traits and what's your th three, you know, greatest weaknesses? And right. they usually coincide, in my opinion. You know, like I'm a hard worker. That's almost detriment sometimes because I'm right. like, wow, you know, I haven't had a vacation in 10 years. I don't get out. And I don't have my own personal life a lot of the time. So, I think, for instance, to come back to Washington, it's like 70% of your populace is on the western side of the Cascades. It's like Seattle, Olympia area. Right. Um, no wolves yet. Uh, very little bear activity. You know, there's some cougars over there. But you go to the east side and there's 30% of the populace and there's a lot of animals over there. Um, but then yet, this side wants wolves, this side doesn't. All the cattle ranching operations are on the east side. So, it's like, wow, we can either look at this as a divide and just totally just push each other back to the ends of the spectrum and not come up with a solution or we can actually like look at this as a potential opportunity to set the bar for how wolves can be managed in a way and, and ranching methodology can be augmented in a way to actually bring a fruitful solution to the table where, you know, the culture still lives, the wolves are out there and now we've fostered an appreciation for this apex predator on the landscape again. So I love this sort of 10,000 foot view that we're taking about like philosophically, we have to find ways for these disparate groups to work together. And I'd love to zoom in closely and be like, what is 
how are you mitigating these issues? Like, what do you do to change wolf behavior? What do you do to change rancher behavior to maintain the culture, but also allow this this coexistence? Okay, yeah, that's a great question. Um, and it's a commonly asked question. They're like, what what the heck are you doing? You know, yeah. so, <laughs> what is it? What's your yeah, day what do you to day? Do? So, well, there is no nine to five. So right. the first one is like, you just don't know what you're going to encounter that day. Uh, and the days are usually like minimum 12 hours, you know, and, mm-hmm. and a lot longer a lot of the times. Um, so on the ground, I guess you would start with, to answer your question about wolves, we'll go there first, I guess. Um, so I overlay my my pattern of activity with the cattle during the most potential times of conflict. Like wolves are crepuscular animals. That means they're active at you know dawn and dusk usually. I love that word, crepuscular. I, I do too. I try to throw it around as often as I, I can. I do too. And if I get the chance, I'm like crepuscular. You know? so, <laughs> I um, always forget it. Chance always asks me. He's like, what does that mean? The dawn to dusk. I'm like, oh, I don't remember. You're like, damn it. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so that's a... You overlay your presence with the cattle during the most times of potential predation, basically. And then you always have like, it's a commu- it's a cumulative process for one. And it's also something that, um, so you know what the term aversive conditioning is? Mm-hmm. So we would utilize that at Wolf Haven for our pre-release Mexican uh, gray wolves before they were released out of the wild, whether it's a soft or hard release, different, you know, we can dive into the weeds there. But um, so basically we, we just didn't want wolves to look at humans and go like, oh, what are, what are you doing? You know, we, right. we want them to look at you and go, bam, we're out. You know, we're, we're going to run away. We have to have that innate fear from them because right. especially for, for my work, I mean, I need them to look at any kind of like human structure, any kind of livestock, anything that's associated with human behavior and just be like, nope, that's that's too much. So Right. And that's really important for like re-release, you know, organisms that are going into a new environment because that first, I mean, I, again, I'm not the scientist that's doing this work day to day, but like that first six months has to be when they're learning strategies to survive in this landscape, right? Yeah. And so if they are already pre-primed with, okay, we don't, we're not even going to look at human structures or human activity as a source of calories. Yep. We're going to go the other way because there are other ways to survive here. We're just not going to take that. And that's a really good actually point that you're making. It's like you want them to start that process with some on the ground knowledge already instead of going like, oh, well, this is all new to us. What what do we do? You know, oh, look, there's cows. You know, so um, (laughs) ideally, um, so I act as a buffer. Uh, We'll go back to that. So I find the cattle. I locate the cattle. Um, a lot of these are in large, expansive areas. Like the last few years, I've been working in 30,000 acres with two wolf packs. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. It's a little daunting sometimes. So, <laughs> um, I'm always trying to like try and find funding to increase the team because um, my methodology greatly varies from other range riders in the state that are doing things in just a different way and maybe have different different goals. Um, so, my my whole pattern there is act as a buffer associate negative stimulus using aversive conditioning methods to wolves when they come near cattle. And you have to do that, you know, like initially I'll just pursue them. My presence usually is enough. If you're in the herd and they come out and they're like sneaking around, they're like, wait, there's that weird guy on the horse, the big hair. We can't do this. You know, they got to go. Like that's weird. I got to go. Yeah. So like wolves and all wildlife and and us in general, like we're 75% water, right? And water always takes a path of least resistance. So if you think of that, these animals are always doing that. So they're like risk to gain masters. They look at a scenario and they're like, what am I getting from this? And what potential outcome negatively will I have to deal with? You know, right. so if you can always stack that risk up, they're like, wow, there's just no gain there with these cattle. So I'll just go hunt the deer and the elk and the moose and my natural prey base. So you go about that um, pursuing. Uh, I've, I've utilized uh, like a rubber buckshot, capsaicin filled paintballs. In certain circumstances, like when wolves come down to like private ranching operations where there's like an infrastructure of like fencing and stuff, you can use things like flagery, um, which is like a string. It's like a hot wire, imagine, like some red flags every two feet. So, wolves generally are very neophobic, right? And that just means scared of new things. So, if they're coming up to this fence and like there's nothing here, but I see a bunch of little baby little meatballs in there, I might just try that. You know, I might I might cross that barrier and see what that's like if the risk of the new is worth the reward for the food that i see correct but if we can stack up like you know on that like private land you know it's like you can actually have like flagery or other like lights you you can do like um like audible deterrence as well but generally it's human presence it's being out there it's immersing yourself in this environment and becoming a part of it and then knowing where the cattle are knowing where the wolves are knowing how they historically use that landscape and then knowing how they're currently using it and then just kind of keeping the wolves up in the mountains and keeping the cattle um, where they should be. So it's really an interesting. Thank you for that answer. That was an excellent, you know, snapshot of what are the methods you're using to to protect these cattle and, and who has the financial incentive to protect their cattle, right? They're hiring you to protect their cattle as investment, right? 
Well, they're they're not hiring me personally, so that's okay. a whole other topic. If if you want, we can address that. Yeah, or, let's yeah. dive in. So, okay. so how how does this whole thing work? So, funding is always kind of the crux of my job. Um, but like ranchers, you have to understand coming from their point of view. You know, um, they've been generationally taught like the best thing to do with a wolf is just to get it out of there. I mean, you've seen the pictures of the old stacks of pelts so high, and they're higher than the cabin. I mean, so generationally ingrained mentalities of like delete those apex predators it's the best way like you said earlier to keep my livelihood safe i just kick them off the landscape i extricate them i I kill them you know um so i think uh by offering a service that actually mitigates that conflict it opens up that dialogue you know like the first few years um i was going off on another tangent i'm sorry (laughs) Uh, no no go ahead (laughs) but uh for the first few years like i realized uh like listen twice as much as you speak that's what we got two ears in one mouth right so I believe that's a very important aspect. When I came in there, I didn't want them to have their walls go up and be like, you know, I, I, what are you coming over here from the west side? And you're going to tell me how to run my operation. I've been living here. I've got, you know, my four or five generations on this property that we've been ranching. And you think you're going to come over here and augment this or something right. for, for wolves, you know? So I think in the beginning, it was a very hard hurdle to, and not even hard. It was just a complicated hurdle to overcome because they're like, well, what is your motivation here? You know, and I think... By through transparency, honesty, and just um, being out there. I mean, no matter if it's like sideways snow, it's just inclement weather, you're out there all the time. They're like, man, I keep coming out here and this guy's still out here riding. I think that builds a bridge to where they're like, wow, you care actually about me and I feel safer. So that fear based reaction is almost nullified at that point. And then that opens up a dialogue because they're like, well, why the hell are you out here? Why, why are you doing this? I'm like, oh, I love wolves. And I realized real quick that I came over here to save wolves. And I have to save your community as well, you know, and not to say that like, oh, I'm saving the community. Right, yeah, but it's like, not a savior complex. It's just yeah. like, I care about this. And if I care about this, then I also have to care about that. Correct. And I think we needed more of that in this world because all these fates are intertwined. Like you said earlier, we're all on the same planet. Right. And so that's cool. So it's like, I mean, that's you're talking about being a bridge maker, right? Yeah. That's we both care about your cattle. Yep. I care about your cattle because of how it affects the wolves. Yep. You care about your cattle because it's your livelihood, but we both care about those cattle. Yep. We're both putting effort into making sure that those animals live the best lives, have the best possible outcomes. Yep. And that's how we create this conversation Correct. of how do we work together instead of against each other. Yeah, and even more on that is, because uh, you know, in the beginning it was like, yeah, I care about this because I need to save them to keep these guys alive. But then you start having dinner with these families and then they, they, you know, I've had a few of them bring me lunch cause they're like, I know you're not eating a lot and you're on the range rider diet. <laughs> you know? So I was like, <laughs> that humbles you. You're like, wow, you actually care about me now. So it, it even goes from that to like, I have to save the wolves and keep your cattle alive. It goes, it transcends that to like, no, now I also want to do it just because I love you guys. Like we're now friends, you know, we're, we're, uh, I'm part of this community and you're, you're allowing me in here. Um, you ingratiate yourself in that community by just true, honest work. And I mean, like there was this one instance I was saying, I had this rancher ask me, you know, he's like, can you come help round up for, you know, calving? And I was like, oh, absolutely. You know, that's great knowledge for me. Um, and I always will help you, you know. So I show up and I had, you know, what Chaco sandals are? Mm-hmm. Yes. I was the only footwear I had. They're cracked in half the left one. It's got <laughs> duct tape around it. It's like a very, it's not even a shoestring budget. It's like a little tiny string budget that I run on. So <laughs> Thread budget. Yeah, yeah. Um, I had an angel funder buy me new clothes, in fact. So, <laughs> like, you can't go into California looking like that, Daniel. I was like, oh, that's a good point. Um, anyways, so I get there and they come out, his cow hand and him, and he, they're like looking at me like, hey, Daniel, what the hell is this? You know, like, what are you doing? I was like, my feet are like, well, well I'm here to help you, you know? So I was like... <laughs> And they're like, you, you can't do that. And I was like, no, I can. And you know I will. And they're like, yeah, but no. So uh, Mike goes and grabs his boots and he hands me his boots. He's like, put these on. I was like, okay. And we do the day. We go throughout it and I help them. And they're very gracious and, and very grateful about it. And um, so then like maybe, I don't know, a week or two later, it's like well before my birthday, right? Like uh, I, I, July is my birthday and this is like four months prior. So <laughs> I get there and he's like, hey, come inside. I was like, okay. And he just hands me a pair of brand new boots. And I was wow. like. That's what I said. I was like, wow, you know, that means a lot to me. And he's like, yeah, just consider it an early birthday present. And he's like, you can't be walking around like that. I know what work you do. I know that you're, you're not going to stop because of your, you know, your attire. So, you know, right. so it's like, Absolutely. wow, that meant a lot. And it just, it's very humbling to see somebody go from like, I don't really like them. I don't really trust you to like, I will take care of you. You know, it's like basically as humans, I believe that we tend to draw a circle and protect what's in that circle. And for me, I've learned to uh, just draw a bigger circle. 
Yeah. And I think these guys are learning that too by that action. It was like, wow, that just meant so much to me. You know? Absolutely. So. And classically, rural America is a very tight-knit community, right? Yeah. We all yeah. show up to help with each other's harvest because yep. I can't do it by myself. Why would I expect you to be able to do what you're doing by yourself? If we all work together, we help each other. Yep. And it's just a matter of becoming part of the community, yeah. right? Yeah, I help absolutely. you, you help me, and, and together we do more than any individual could do by themselves. Absolutely. And to be honest, like I feel so much more at home in rural communities. I just, I feel like that's where I belong. You know, I remember the first time, little tangent story. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, I love the tangents. I, I, same here. And I go off on them. So if I, <laughs> if I go off too much, just like reel me back in. But anyways, <laughs> um, so I, I told my, you know, I have a 26 foot U-Haul and I have my little Jeep behind me and I'm, I drive over to Colville and I find a place to rent and uh, have my horse and my, I was into herpetology. So I have like lizards and dogs yes. and cats. I know, right? I love yes. That's a whole nother conversation. Don't get started, Chance. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's the tangent. It's like, yes. Yeah. So, so anyways, I drive over there and it was interesting. Like I, I wasn't accustomed to driving like in deep snow and I have a little tiny Jeep Wrangler, you know, at that time I didn't have my big truck. So, um. I'm driving down the road, you know, in, in Western Washington, if there's like a half an inch of snow, they shut down the world. They're like, nope, we can't do anything. Yep. In Eastern Washington, it's like you'll be driving on ice, sheets of ice and just big, you know, that's it's just. like, you, just go slow. You'll be fine. Yeah, exactly. It's just, this is how we have to live over here. It's harder, but it's like really rewarding to like dive in and like be yeah. a part of that system. <laughs> so anyways, I'm driving my Jeep. I end up running in a snowbank because I hit ice and I'm like, oh crap. And I run in a snowbank. The first car that goes by stops the truck. Like, oh man, do you need help? You know, <laughs> there's no, great. there's no cell reception, right? So I can't call AAA. There's, I don't know anybody and they pull up and they're like, you know, what do you, they pull me out and they're like, so what do you, you know, I was like, oh, my name's Daniel. I, I don't recall their names, but it was a couple. Um, and they're like, what are you doing up here? And I was like, oh, I, <laughs> I just moved up here to try and help bring solutions to the table regarding wolves. And like, huh. And they're like, so do you have a wife? And I was like, nope. And they're like, do you have kids? They're like, nope. And they're like, do you, do you have friends up here? And I was like, nope, it's just my animal family and I. And they're like, why don't you come down? We live three houses down the right. You can come out for dinner if you want. Come on in. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. Because if I did that same thing and pulled off on the side of the road with a little half inch of ice on Seattle streets, I would have probably had 50 cars pass me. Yeah. Right. And it's that, it's that mentality of like, help your neighbor out. You know, even I was a new guy. And they're like, right. help your neighbor out. You're here. You're in the community. I'm yeah. Help you it was, I mean, it took some time to like really become a a part of that but now it's just so rewarding on so many levels to and honored you know and, yeah. and humbling so absolutely i kind of want to get back a little bit into your background and how you got into this work because it's probably naive of me to say but like range riding in general like I feel like a lot of people, maybe it's not just me, think about it as like a wild west kind of thing. Like it's something you see in films, right? Like yeah, yeah. it's a like lost art. It's like, oh, is is that a thing? Like people do. So how did you get into this? Is it something you always knew about you wanted to do? And I know you started your own business yeah. to do this. So I'm just curious about what that journey was like. That's a great question, Sarah. Um, it was hard. It was long and arduous, but it started with a. Uh, so I worked at. You know, I, I gathered my experience with wolves at at a world-renowned wolf sanctuary on the west side. And then I was like, wow, you know, I'm in this sanctuary and I love these animals. I mean, we had like 63 animals there and I, I miss hearing that like chorus howl three, yeah. four times a day. It would just stop me and whatever I was doing. It would wake me up out of a dead sleep and I was just, they're just speaking to your soul, you know, at that point. And uh, so anyways, I I felt though like it was a sanctuary for me as well. And I'm seeing in the, you know, news reports in Eastern Washington, like we're killing wolves and there's all these problems going on. I was like, man, I'm not really effectively making change here i'm keeping these guys safe and i have this amazing opportunity to learn about them but you know what attracted me to them was them being wolves and that's a wild factor you know these guys are safe they're not going to go anywhere they have a they're they're secure you know so i was like well and i i literally pulled out a damn map with all the wolf population and it was all in this little corner in northeast washington and i was like well what's this place it's colville and i was like I'm going to move there. That's so where I, I need to go. Yeah. I went up there for a weekend and I found that spot that I mentioned, you know, that I rented. And so I got up there and I remember thinking, what the hell are you doing? You know, like I'm sitting there in this house and I'm like, okay, you don't have a job. You're in this weird area. You don't know anybody. Like the guy said, he's like, no wife, no kids. No, I was like, no, I just me, my horse, my reptiles, you know, my cats, my dogs. <laughs> and so I was like, well, how am I going to help wolves out here? And I was like, well, maybe I'll write a book. You know, maybe I'll, I, I didn't know what I was going to do. And that was really positive because it's like, if you don't have necessarily set plans sometimes, but you have this goal, 
you just aim at that goal because the plans are subject to change, right? They're always going to be like, oh, crap, I didn't know I was going to not have funding this year, but I'm still going to keep on the goal, right? Right. So, I just I remember sitting there going, huh, it was kind of a dark time because you're like, I don't even know what I'm going to do and and how long can I sustain this even, you know? Um, and I still question that, but but in the beginning, it was like, what the hell? And so... I remember that I had heard about range riding. There's some, uh, there's part of that in Canada. I mean, those ranchers, it's a different setup, but they just kind of range ride for themselves. Um, the area that I'm in, a lot of the ranchers, little little side contextual piece, um, they have to farm hay. The Forest Service requires X amount of head on the allotment. <clears throat> so they actually have to have a lot of cows and they have, like in Montana, you have like these huge pastures that you can do rotational grazing like, right. that's not an option here so when they come back in the winter they have to have enough hay to keep those cows that that number of head through and sustain them through the winter um because this system is basically you put these animals out on public land when it's you know growing season, in june yeah. right and there's plenty of food available for yep. them and you let them go out and be grass-fed and then you bring them back to your land yep. and October. overwinter them yep exactly exactly chance so um so that's kind of a problem I saw. I was like, okay, so they don't have the ability even because they're, they're farming hay. They have to. There's no option or else those cows won't live. Right. And then their whole their whole business model has gone. Um, so it's like they don't have the ability to go range ready for themselves. So to get back on your question, Sarah, uh, I know everything's a long answer. It all ties it's all together. related. It does. All it does. Together. <laughs> so I was like, well, I've heard of this range riding stuff in Canada. You know, it's a different setup, but maybe I can offer that service. So I called the, you know, the state, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, and I was like, hey, you know, I've got a lot of experience with wolves and I would just like to help. And I, you know, I was starting to gain experience with horses. Um, I had not had the privilege of having horses in my life when I was younger, but at that point I'd rescued my horse Griff and, and he taught me everything I know about horses. And, um, so anyways, I was like, they, they were like, no, we're not hiring any range riders. You know, we have no interest in that. I was like, Oh, okay. And I go back to the drawing <laughs> book and I go sit in my living room. And that's, you know, what am I going to do? You know, and this, I don't know. Um, so then I was like, well, if you really want to do something and nobody will hire you for doing that, what do you do? You start your own business. I was like, that's what I'll do. So then I called them back up, I don't know, a month later after running all that gamut of the, you know, the loopholes and the red yep. tape to start that, um, which was a whole other story there too. But uh, then I called them up and I was like, hey, would you like to contract with my small business? They're like, oh, that'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, well, now that you mention it, it's the same question. I know, it's exactly. just me, but I have an LLC after my name exactly. now. Exactly. It's like, okay, whatever. I mean, if that gets me in, that gets me in. So, um, so from that point on, I, July 3rd, the day before my birthday, I was out there writing. I was like, wow, I've, I've done it. It's created. I got, the, you know, I got the whole thing going, you know, and I was like out there writing on the back of Griff and this, you know, that allotment specifically is like 28,000 acres and there's a pack of wolves up there and there's like, you know, 175 pairs of cattle. And I was like, so now what the hell do you do? <laughs> I was like, wow, you got to learn. So, um, that was just a process of like. Finding out what the ranch, you know, what do you know about these guys? What do you know about where are you seen wolves? Where do your cattle usually go? And then just putting all these different pieces together. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. And then you can actually take that 10,000 view. Go, okay, here's what we got to do to accomplish this goal. So the plan, like I said, always subject to change. The goal is always solid. Yeah. So. I like to imagine that first time you're out there and you see this big pack of wolves and all this cattle and you're like, oh, what do I do? And you're like all right, just going to start like riding toward him and like <laughs> yeah. screaming and everything. Like that's, I could just see it in a movie basically. Just on, like, ah! Honestly, Sarah, that's kind of was like, I don't know at first, you know, and I was like, <laughs> wow. Yeah. And I was like, they do respond to that. They, yeah. they were like, oh, And the crap. wolves are like, what the heck? Okay, yeah. man. <laughs> exactly. Nobody's really, you know, I, I don't know if you've seen that film, but like I said in there, it's like nobody is taking the time to offer them true solutions in that community. So it leaves them with their own devices and generationally that's been a box of bullets. Right. So once you start doing that, they're like, wow, I'm seeing actually results from this. So maybe I'll participate. Like in the beginning, I could have supplied all the demand because there was like two ranches. Right. Now it's like, oh crap, you know, I need to upscale right. this and offer a better solution. Um, so And it's really interesting because one of the, I think one of the other conversations we've had um, around like regenerative agriculture yeah. is that farming and agriculture and ranching is so effort intensive it oh, takes yeah. every literally every day of labor that you can provide just to make harvest happen and so because of that a lot of agriculturalists and ranchers are really there's a lot of inertia to changing the methods because i know this method works it's gotten me a consistent return on this investment every year and i don't i can't risk having a bad year because one bad year means my my ranch goes under yeah. right and so to have somebody else who can come in and say, I'm going to supply this effort. 
I'm going to show you that this new technique works is the nudge that gets the boulder rolling down the hill. Correct. And once it's a well documented phenomena that this type of wildlife human interaction mitigation works, yeah. then it's a lot easier for a rancher to say, oh, I do have a couple of, of days this year that I can go range riding. I, you know, I've, I've got time that I can do this. Yeah. And that's not, like you said, I mean, it's a hard life that they're living in. And even in like the perfect scenario, they still might have a variable that they didn't account for that just totally screws that year. It's just detrimental to that year. And so to add wolves on top of that is what they're seeing. Like the government just threw wolves out here. Now I'm left to this. It's like, I already have a hard life. And now you're just, <clears throat> there's already like a mentality that they might be trying to potentially get me off public land. They're trying to move rural America, you know, and divorce from it. Right. And it's like, I don't want to see that. And, and by offering that service, I think you do exactly what you said. You're like, I will help you on this end so you can actually put more attention on, on your ranching operation. And I think that is really critical. Now, definitely, again, like the varied methodology will produce different results. I mean, there's some people out there that are covering six allotments by driving into one of them for an hour. And it's like you can't effectively right. prevent conflict or even see cows or wolves at that point. So right, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Uh, just real quick. What is the value of a single head of cattle? Like if a wolf pack were to take down one of these livestock, what financial cost does that represent to a rancher? Potentially thousands of dollars. I mean, you have to look at it also as not just a head maybe, but like if that was like a, a mother cow, like how many calves would I've had? If that's a bull, how many calves would I have had if now he's gone? Now I have to go buy a $7,000 bull um, and lost all the potential offspring from that. So it could be extremely detrimental. Um, that's another reason why it's really important to just prevent that conflict before it ever happens. You know, it's it's a no-brainer to me. I'm like, we got to guide the process instead of react to it is what it comes down to. And I see so much reactionary mentality from like state fishing game and other, other entities that are like, this is not the way to do it, you know? Yeah. I had a rancher that <clears throat> called me, oh, this is probably a month ago now, and he's like, he had seven wolves, like, at the end of this this corner of this building, um, and that's in his pasture. I mean, this wow. guy literally has, like, Nat Geo. He he, got, he brought me there once. This guy that handed me the boots. And he's like, Daniel, why don't you look at something? So we're standing at his front door, and if you drew a 50-foot circle in diameter, there was wolf, coyote, cougar bobcat tracks right there and wow. like that's if you open your front door and you're like so right there and he's yeah. pointing he's like i saw one of you. i love it he's like i saw one of your dogs underneath the street light the other night and i was like oh crap my dogs and he's like no the wolves i was like oh okay yeah. I, was like, <laughs> I was like those guys can travel pretty far pretty quick but um so i think uh when you when you have that much interaction with wildlife it, it can kind of be scary if you're if you're left to your own devices, you know. So For sure. I don't know. I was going to go on to something else there, but I don't recall. Apologize. I think that came from like talking about what the expense is to a rancher to lose a head of cattle and, yeah. and how you know it's important to not be reactionary about that's it. That's right. right. That's right. So thank you. I appreciate the chance. You guys are good at this. <laughs> I'm like I got so much information I'll unload it sometimes, and I apologize for that. But so this rancher, he had seven wolves, and you know, just right there, and he's like. And at that time, I didn't have a contract. And I, and I volunteer as much as I can, but, you know, the price of diesel, the price of hay is going up. It's insane. So, it's hard to, like, I mean, it's it's a very tough lifestyle. And it very much mirrors the ranching lifestyle in many ways, even more extreme sometimes. Because, right. like, I'm spending tons more money to actually watch those cows than they are to even graze them out in these public land allotments. So, there's this weird dynamic there. But, anyways, he called the fishing game three times at that point said, I need some help. Gave him detailed messages. Three different days. Wolves kept coming back. They didn't even call him back. And he said, Daniel, I saw, you know, his property is laid out to where there's a long, it's kind of like a long chunk of land. And he was out there with his cattle. And he's like, I saw one of the, the fishing game rigs come up. And he's like, I think he actually might have stopped and put out a radio telemetry. But then he just kept going. And I was like, well, that's sad, man, because that means they didn't even acknowledge you. They didn't call you back. And they just kind of left you hanging. Right. But then he actually it progressed from that. And this is the first time that I haven't had a contract and been able to work with this man that he's had a depredation in many years. And he had one this year. Wow. And they showed up like that once there was a dead cow on the ground. And it's like that's not the way to approach this. Again, right. You have to be proactive about you it. You do. And and that's not even I think a lot of the times that's their way of ingratiating themselves into the community. It's like, hey, we'll help you get lethal removal. And it's like these guys don't want the problem in the first place. If we can prevent that problem in the first place, it actually fosters a want or at least an appreciation or at least an acceptance 
at the very least of wolves in the landscape. But at that point when they're going through the problems, it's not like they're like, cool, thanks for killing those wolves and now I like them a lot better. No, they're like, this is still crap. You know, right. and you're, you're Now we have it. dead cattle and dead wolves. Yeah, yeah. And I've even had, you know, I had a rancher say that last year. He's like, I don't want them shooting these pups. And I mean, you know, there's a whole instance there where Fishing Game actually shot a pup from another pack to a Wow. And it was like, this is not productive. You know, this is, there's a better way. So yeah. that's where I jumped into this foolishly or not. But, <laughs> yeah. For anyone listening, where could they find Range Rider and where could they also go to find uh, more about your business? Um, so my business is griffs.com, G R I P H S.com. Um, and you'll have all my contact info there. Um, and then Range Rider, if you go to rangeriderfilm.com. And that's uh, Colin Arsman's film uh, production company. And, yeah, I couldn't have asked for a better group of people to to convey the story because it's such a already polarizing subject. You have to really be careful. And I've had some people want to do stories in my work. And it's kind of like, well, you just actually want to adulterate the narrative to suit your own agenda. And that's right. not what this needs again. This needs total transparency, total honesty, and hard work. You know, we don't need to make this more complicated. Let's so. not sensationalize this Correct. any yeah, further. It's than already it super sensationalized. Right. We don't need to make that worse. So right. um, yeah, griffs.com and rangeriderfilm.com. Cool. So. so if y'all are listening, you want to check it out, scroll on down to the show notes. I'm going to drop those links right there. So you can go straight from listening to learning more about this amazing world. I, you know, completely transparently, I've spent this entire episode being like, okay, so what would it take to get me out to Washington this summer and like just spend a week learning what this is? But uh, <laughs> yeah, Please come up, man. We'll, we'll, uh, I'm, I'm going to keep thinking about that. But thank you so much for being on the show. This has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Chance. Thank you, Sarah. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to this episode of Conservation Connection. If you enjoyed our podcast, go ahead and subscribe to make sure you catch every episode that we post. We'd love to hear from you. So if you want to reach out, go to our website, lastchanceendeavors.com backslash contact and shoot us an email. We love questions from our listeners. So if you heard something you'd like to learn more about, be sure to let us know. If you've got a minute to spare, leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts will help other conservation-minded people find the show. We'd really appreciate it. A big thanks to the people working to protect our planet and a big thanks to you for listening. Don't forget to tune in next time.